Welcome to Tuesday. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. So today I wanted to do a few things. So the first one is I'm, I'm excited about our guest lecture two days from now. There, Carrie is going to be talking about intelligent tutoring systems. And she was kind enough to put together a few lectures for us. So the plan is that we are going to watch these videos. I say we because I haven't watched them yet. I'm a bad person. Um, but we are going to watch these videos. And then we'll be able to ask questions and discuss them on Thursday. And then if there's time, Carrie will be, might be able to give us some extra insights into our course proposals. So because there was a number of videos, I put a link to a Google Doc. So if you click before the class, watch the ITS videos here. If you click here, that brings you to a Google Doc, which has a whole bunch of individual links. The total length of this is just a little less than, than 60 minutes. So it, please don't feel overwhelmed because there's so many links. But I do, I do ask you to uh, watch all of these so that we can be prepared for Thursday's class. Any questions about that or comments? Intelligent tutoring systems has not really been a core focus of this class. And Carrie does teach, a, uh, I believe, a graduate course on the topic. But I did want to get, get that um, into the class because if we're talking about humans and machines, machine learning agents interacting, thinking about how can I teach a human, but also how can I model that human? How can I understand what they know and what they don't know? And that's going to be pretty important particularly when we talk about teaming. So we'll talk, we'll have one lecture about the intelligent tutor, tutoring systems and how to model users, but then we'll jump into a week of explainability, interpretability. So the core hypothesis here is that if the human can better understand the machine learner, then you will have better performance of the system. And then finally, we'll then finish up with a week on teaming. So really thinking about how agents, machine learning agents and humans can work together to accomplish some, something. And last week, Dorian had talked a little bit about that in terms of getting, you know, 10 or 100 agents working together. And those agents could be controlled by reinforcement learning, by decision trees, or by humans. So that was, that was exciting. Um, so I mentioned this on Discord. But today, I was hoping to spend the, the bulk of the class talking about the project proposals that you all submitted. So I've gone through most of them, but I wanted to give, give us a chance to, well, first of all, I think it'd be cool for people to see what other people are doing, because um, I think there are a number of really neat ideas. But even more important, this will give us a chance to provide each other feedback. Because as I said before, this is the first time I'm teaching this class, this is the first time trying to get you know, some kind of pilot study done in a single semester. So I, I think by giving us, uh, giving each other these kinds of support and feedback, then we'll be more likely to succeed. But the, the goal of this is going to be to get help from each other. It's not going, you, you have not created a presentation. So I'm just asking you to, to share your screen and talk about your proposal and we're, and, and the goal is to offer kind of constructive feedback and hopefully we can come up with some novel ideas and approaches. So I think, I think what I'd like to do is just let people volunteer. So if, if for some reason this is um, anxiety inducing and you really don't want to talk about your project, I'm not gonna make you, um, but remember you will have that final presentation at the end of the semester. So you'll have to talk about it eventually. And I encourage you to kind of break the ice today. So with that said, would anyone be willing to go first? Yeah, I can, I can go ahead. <laughs> awesome, thanks Vlad. And people, people are welcome to um, just unmute and, and talk. Or of course, you can ask or, or make remarks in the, um, uh, let's use the questions and comments about Matt's lectures, even though this isn't Matt's lecture. Uh, I don't know, should we use that or the project brainstorming? Let's go to project brainstorming. So as, as you have comments or questions, if you could drop them into the project brainstorming channel, 
or just unmute. That would be awesome. And that, that way too, when uh, we put stuff into the Discord channel, then people don't have to worry so much about taking notes. Yeah, and just to make sure we actually get through everyone, how many proposals do we have just for reference? 10. 10, so, so okay, within, so like within seven eight, minutes each? <laughs> yeah, well, with an 80 minute class, we're going for about seven, eight minutes. My guess that there will be some people who really like talking, Vlad, which is totally fine. Um, and there'll be some people who probably don't want, end up talking as much. But if we could shoot for around eight minutes, that would be awesome. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so I'm working with Rowan um, on our project. And I'll start it off by explaining the background and like the first simple step that we hope to achieve. And then he'll um, come in and talk about some more exciting um, ways forward. So yeah, so to start it off, there is this paper called Effective Reinforcement Learning for Mobile Robots. And it's a bit older, it's from like 2002. And the main point of the paper is trying to address how do we help robots learn quicker? Um, a classic problem of reinforcement learning because if you just let it explore in the environment, it's gonna take very long for it to explore and find the right way to get to the goal or to find the goal in general. And then the updates will only update probably states and actions that are very close to that goal. It'll take very long to learn. So obviously it tries to add some sort of human biasing towards the learning process to speed up learning. Okay, so what they propose is to have this two, two phase system. So in the first phase, um, and this is like with a Q learning algorithm. So in the first phase, the agent does not have any control it, over its behavior. And all the control is supplied by some controller or a human being. Um, so I'm interested in the human being case and that's what they've done most of their experience with. So a, a human being is basically has like an actual joystick that they're using to control this robot and it's a physical robot in this experiment. And so they guide this robot and show it how to get to the goal and they clearly specify in this paper that these, let me just read exactly what they say here. Um, they say, <laughs> there was no attempt, no attempt was made to make them good examples by the people. So there were examples of how to get to the goal, but they were apparently not good. <laughs> okay, so um, the human shows behavior of how to get to this goal and the agent, the Q learning agent passively just absorbs these states and this behavior and updates its Q function based on that. Um, after a certain period of time, this phase one stops and phase two begins. And in phase two, it's basically regular reinforcement learning where the agent has full control over all of its behavior. And the starting point is the Q function that it, update, that it updated after all of the behavior that it observed from the human. And what they show in the paper is that, yay, phase one training of 30 episodes um, helped the agent a bit and then after that they start phase two and it significantly improved performance and if you did this in regular with regular rl from the start um so these i guess total of 75 episodes or so here took about two hours to show um and then they said that if they were to just train an equivalent robot in simulation it took about like seven days or something to to get the equivalent performance or something like that so it's supposed to be significantly faster so that's that's basically the whole point of this paper is they, they're showing that. Um, so they don't discuss, and they kind of this, mention this at the very end, they don't discuss about how important the length of phase one is, um, what's an ideal length of phase one, is like one or two episodes enough? How does that affect its performance? And maybe if you, phase one is too long, you bias the agent to do something that's actually incorrect, and then it's gonna have to like start unlearning and maybe it'll actually take longer than you'd like to, to learn. So there's there's like, so I guess the, the thing that I'm interested in, me and Rowan are interested in, is how long should this phase one be and how does that kind of affect the agent's performance afterwards? So the simple first thing to, to, to analyze is essentially um, different variations on the length of phase one. So um, we propose testing this in a simpler environment, not a real robot, and something like a, a grid world or um, maybe some sort of continuous environment like Mount or something, where the human um, will give us demonstrations and we'll gather maybe like a hundred episodes of demonstrations or something. And then we can try this phase two learning with different chunks of 
um, demonstrations or different amounts of episodes of the human. So maybe like ranging from one to a hundred in different um, chunks of that and seeing how phase two is affected by that. And maybe even seeing if phase two um, is affected by too much of uh, phase one because of some like bias towards the wrong actions. So that's, um, and I guess the, the, the end goal, the, the hypothesis, there's, there's going to be kind of like some sweet spot of like after this many, it's not really, it doesn't really matter how many episodes you got from the human anymore. That's, uh, this is sufficient. Maybe like after 30 episodes, it's not really important to get any more demonstrations. So that's our first goal. And then maybe Rowan can talk about where, where we can take that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Vlad. So uh, hopefully the first part will be relatively achievable and leave some time for the next goal, which would be to take advantage of a lot of the excitement and progress around world models and using world models to help agents uh, learn faster and also generalize better to unseen environments. So the second part of what we're going to do if we have time is in phase one, not only collect uh, human trajectories for uh, generating experience for the, for the RL agent, for the Q learner, but also train a generative model of, of those trajectories and then use that generative model to uh, either during phase one or in phase two as well to augment the human experience data set with some synthetic data. And then the question that we're wondering is how much of that synthetic data could actually be useful. Of course, the, it would, they would take some time to actually learn a good model. So perhaps at first, maybe in the first couple of episodes, the generative model is actually hurting the agent, especially if we're using it in phase one. Um, but in phase two, potentially there's a certain amount of synthetic data once we've learned a good model um, that, that could actually help the agent uh, uncover, you know, have more diverse experience. Because one of the main parts of this paper that the authors, one of the main conclusions that the authors made from this paper is that uh, this two-phased approach is useful uh, because they're using the human trajectories to generate experience for the RL system as opposed to just behavioral cloning. So the hypothesis could be that, okay, well, you know, if we have this generative model to synthesize additional experience that's perhaps more diverse, maybe that would be helpful. And so we'd be curious as to what that critical percentage of data is. We'd assume it wouldn't be 100%, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 50. So we'd wanna run some experiments to try that out. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that that's what we'd try to do if there's time. Awesome, I don't know if I'd do thanks right guys. That. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you've got um, a couple of key things you can investigate. So thinking about how the quality of the demonstrations and the quantity of demonstrations affect learning. Um, you could also think about both of those two things in terms of the generative model. Do other, other people have uh, questions or suggestions though? I'm gonna shut up for a minute. I have a bit, of a bit of a question. I'm wondering what the difference between using synthetic data is and just kind of the exploration of an RL system. If, if those are really actually different? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose that with the advantage of having a sort of a generative model to is you can use it to plan and you don't actually have to take actions in the real environment with it. Um, and also you would being able to train a model from human data would remove the need to have a human, um, in the loop after phase one. Okay, sure. Well, and is, are you learning, are you trying to learn a model that you can plan over? Or are you trying to learn a model that can produce additional trajectories for you and that you could use it as data that you don't have to pay for? Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't two be the, how are those two things different? How would they be different? Oh, so um, in, in one of them, so the, the first one is just no, a normal model learning approach where you try to learn the transition and reward function and then can just do a, a bunch of planning and then figure out how to act. And then maybe, maybe you improve the model and kind of iterate. Or you might think, well, my model isn't good enough to really plan 
but maybe I could just have it generate a bunch of rollouts. So just like I, I was using rollouts from the human to pre-train my agent, maybe I could use these rollouts from the model to kind of pre-train my agent as well. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I don't know which one would be better or preferable actually. Yeah, and maybe to add on to that, like from, from the first part of the experimentation, if we notice that, you know, like phase one um, helps out indefinitely, as long as like the quality, or not indefinitely, but like for quite a long period of time, for quite a bit of episodes, then like it would, I guess, show some motivation to create more synthetic examples. So the human maybe only demonstrates like five to 10 episodes, and then you generate like another thousand or something. And yeah, just uh, maybe add on to that. I think this, this like, maybe this generative stuff would become more and more valuable as the environment gets more and more complex. Because like, uh, like I hypothesize that for smaller <laughs> environments, you don't need that many demonstrations. But like, as the, if the environment's like very complex, um, there's all sorts of different ways you can maneuver in like, let's say like a 1,000 by 1,000 grid world with random obstacles around. So there's like a whole bunch of different demonstration like then a human then you might need data in the thousands is what i'm saying then you're not going to get a human to demonstrate a thousand examples so maybe as as the environment gets more and more complex it becomes more and more beneficial so are you sticking strictly with uh like the tabular setting then for your experiments yeah, so I think the first, we, yeah, our plan was to begin with a tabular setting to make things simpler at the start. Um, yeah, but I don't know about the pros and cons of that right now, of like which one, if we should maybe just not, like if moving to a function approximation case is more realistic to start and we shouldn't start the tabular one, but I, I just thought for like, reducing the, the difficulty at the beginning, it would make sense to try with tabular. I guess, yeah, the only reason I was kind of curious is at least with my experience with these more model-based RL stuff is usually they're like continuous domains and this and that. Like, um, I don't see why you couldn't just use like out of the RL1 textbook, the Dyna architecture. I'm, you know, I don't fully understand the work that you're doing or whatever, but like presumably if you have at least one trajectory, if you're trying to go to a target state, Maybe you can just have a simple sample model and you don't really need a fancy generative or anything beyond, you know, just holding on to all your data and learning directly from that for like a Q function. But this is your project and I'm just conjecturing. Yeah, and I think I would, I, I think that would be worth, worth investigating. I'm trying to figure out if there's ways of steering this project more towards um, uh, the human part. Because right now, I mean, you, you could just have an agent generate some data and then investigate these, these interesting questions. Yeah, I guess the, the point you're making there is that first demonstrations doesn't have to be based on a human. That it could just be like a, a near optimal agent plane. Right, or, or a suboptimal agent or anything. So, um, so one thing you could try to do if you are interested, is take this domain that you're looking at and try to make it easier or harder. So for instance, make the grid world slippery, slipperier or uh, have a faster simulation speed. And then just try to make some uh, qualitative statements about how the, demo how the demonstrations change when the task becomes harder and whether, whether that's exactly the same as just taking an agent and letting it learn very, for a long time or taking an agent and letting it learn a short time and having a suboptimal policy. Because my, my guess is that suboptimal humans are different in different ways than suboptimal agents. But I'm not sure if that's, that, that might be leading you away from the core thing you're really interested in. Well, I think it addresses the question of like, um, now that we, like, like how does different qualities of demonstration affect us, right? So, which is definitely something we'd like to look at as well. So it's like, how does the quantity affect it, but also the quality, because 
Um, and then the, the quality is possibly different if it's a human or not a human as well, which is what you were mentioning there, which I think is also interesting to look at. Sorry, Matt, were you saying to make the grid world easier or harder as the, as the human is uh, playing the game? Or is that something, could you just elaborate a little bit more on what you meant uh, yeah. in that example? So I was thinking of having maybe two or three conditions, one with a normal game and one with the game much harder, and then um, trying to uh, maybe have some people do A then B, other people do B then A, then have these two sets of data and try to understand if and how they're different. And, oh, and good. So, and if there was, um, if there were large differences here, then you could do something like figuring out, is there a minimum quality to these demonstrations? Or, uh, you know, if, if my demonstration is complete garbage, maybe it's gonna hurt me more than it helps, or maybe it's just data is data. And if you're doing this model learning thing, date, more data is better. So the, so the purpose of having these, these different environment conditions and changing the order in which the people perform the tasks, um, I'm trying to connect how doing A then B that, or B then A connects to like the, uh, like the quality of the data and how that would, um, like what, what would be the motivation for switching the order of the task difficulty for the humans. Well, so, so you could have half of the people do situation A, half of them do B, and then you get your two data sets. Or you could think about having everyone do two, and then in some sense you have four data sets. So then you could look at things like, is there any difference? Do, does the difference between easy and, and hard change based on the ordering? Because there could okay. be some learning effects. Um, okay. and, and you may end up throwing out and just considering only the first condition from everyone and having those two distinct sets of data, or you might be able to find something cool with the extra two sets. Okay. Okay. All right. So if you're, if you're not watching the discord chat, um, Laura suggested that, well, is, is there a place that we could actually see these proposals? So I'm going to um, ask you, I guess, after the class, if, if you're okay with me putting your proposal in Discord where everyone could see it, or e even just putting it in E-class so only U of A people could see it. Because I think, I think there could be some benefit to looking at each other's um, actual proposals, getting ideas, offer, offering suggestions. But I think with... Now that we've spent, what, probably 15 minutes on the eight, on the eight minute discussion, um, we're clearly not gonna get through everything, but would somebody else be willing to volunteer to talk about what, what they were thinking about? Sure, uh, our group can go. Uh, I can also potentially share if, do I have ability to share? I was just gonna throw up the- uh, Yeah, absolutely. And, the, there's the green screen, uh, share screen button at the bottom. There we go. And does that actually work or is that sharing the wrong desktop? Should be showing a PDF. We're looking at compute 656 pilot PDF. Uh, yeah. So this is just if people wanted to read instead of uh, listen to what I'm talking about. But uh, our project is a speed reading application. And so the idea is that there will be a little RL agent in there watching how you use the app to the point where at the end it's able to kind of set the parameters for you. <clears throat> so as you're uh, reading through this uh, body of text, it's going to be throwing up one or two words at a time. And a user has the ability to say, you know, go faster, this is going too slow or slow down or stop, maybe even go back. And from this, the RL agent needs to figure out uh, some some sort of correlation between like, how big the words are, how complex or how rare the words are for determining the speed to, to give these words. So uh, you have the 
uh, go faster, go slower as you use the app. And then at the very end, there'll be maybe a few questions just overall, uh, what was your experience? And then, and then from that, we hope that it will narrow down on exactly what you would need to, to read the fastest. And so we'll be just using some short stories that have some questions attached because we need comprehension to be, to be part of this. Otherwise you could just be clicking yes at the end of every one and you'd get very fast reading, reading speeds, but you didn't actually absorb anything. So uh, just, just looking to see whether or not uh, this speed reader can actually increase the speed of someone's read over some number of, of trials. And so in this app, is it teaching you to speed read or is it helping you speed read with your current skills? I'm not sure I understand the difference. So I would not classify myself as a speed reader of any sort, but uh, there are, uh, for instance, there's this spreader example, things that just you shovel it uh, a body of text and it will, instead of giving you the entire thing out at once, it gives you kind of line by line or word by word, and maybe also showing a line. It just gives you smaller chunks that people are able to read very quickly. And it's kind of, uh, uh, if you give those small chunks quickly enough, then you can kind of trick the brain into reading faster than if you just give the whole, the whole body at the beginning. Got it. So you're trying to ma maximize the performance of the user in this system. Yes. Yeah. And so, and we can also check, uh, compare that to just the same chunk of text um, given as one, one whole block a as a comparison. Uh, there are some questions that we have on how best to get like class input in this. So if this were non-COVID times, we could just have people work off one of our laptops in lab. Otherwise, this needs to turn into a web app or, or we just do the training data ourselves. So I'm not sure exactly how everyone else is going to be tackling that issue. Like the previous group has a joystick. I don't have a joystick. So presumably that just immediately takes me out of that one or or there has to be like a different different type of uh, input. Yeah, the, the UI is an, a great point. Um, I guess I was just assuming people would do stuff online or rely on ga gathering data among their team and people inside their bubble. Sure. So roommates and such. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends on if, if you think the web development's gonna make things harder. If so, I would recommend going with the simplest thing. And there are a few suggestions on how, what's the simplest thing you could do? What's a, what's a reasonable baseline? And I think what you're describing could, to, to, really, to really solve it would probably be a nice master's thesis with like two or, two or three papers. So I think, I, I think um, we're gonna need to think carefully about how to scope this into something that um, that you can uh, accomplish something in a very short time. So, so something like, uh, for instance, if you were trying to learn uh, to train, uh, try to get an RL agent to be able to work across different people, so you could combine all their data instead of having agents trained per person, that might be one thing. Um, figuring out how to make the the action space and the state space as small as possible. Um, so if it was something like the average length of words and I don't know, some other simple feature, then because the more constrained it is, the easier it'll be to learn. Yeah, for words we had, um, we we're trying to keep it as, as state space as small as possible. So length of word and then just like a document frequency uh, to see to see how rare a word is going nice. off the assumption rare words are give people pause yeah and then I think another another big question is what what does the credit assignment look like so 
if if we are getting multiple kinds of feedback from people, so go for uh, go faster, go slower, go back, as well as these qualitative metrics. Well, actually, may, maybe if you just had uh, if if you just had go forward or go back, that that might be a signal that you could directly use. Hmm. Is that? Yeah, the I don't, I've, I've not done RL before. The idea was to directly use these as, as, as the signals for, for the RL agent. So whether or not we have to tweak them a little bit, but it was hopefully just kind of a, a good, good dog, bad dog kind of a thing while, while reading, and then it will do better. The, uh, I guess we were a little bit concerned because things like AlphaGo, AlphaZero did very well off of Good dog, good dog, and and nothing else. Uh, to get great results on uh, such tiny input, you need just a huge amount of data, and there's no chance we're going to get that. So it was, you know, how best to put in as much feedback as we can during the course of one run. So I'm not expecting it to actually be. Um, some super speed reader, but just to notice that, hey, this is actually reasonable. It's, it's, going, it's going in the right direction, at least. Well, and that's, that's another point. If, what if you were trying to learn a function? You were trying to learn what is the speed I should be going based on alpha times the average word length plus beta times the average word complexity. And you were just trying to learn these two parameters and you were going to learn those parameters through the, try to learn this as um, learning these two parameters through this kind of feedback where if they're saying go faster, that means one or both of these needs to be increased in one direction. If, if person says slower then one or both of these have to be decreased. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that, that would not be supervised learning because the person's not giving them a label, not telling them the number, mm -hmm. but just uh, better or worse. Ooh, yeah. So thinking about people with different levels of education or whether they're native English speakers or not. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, like those are neat ideas, but I don't have access to people that don't have, that aren't native speakers at the moment. <laughs> so the, the web development would play a role in that. Like currently the, the prototype app is just a Python web Q, or a QT5 app. So it's kind of annoying to install and run. Um, th so this, this would not be feasible in general, but would it be possible to throw the app onto Docker and have other people in the class download the Docker image and run it? Yeah, that would totally be, po be possible, but Docker itself is a big can of worms, especially on Windows. Okay, so I, well, there's something else like Singularity or something. I thought there were multiple uh, alternatives to Docker, but that's that's something that we as a class could talk about because if if people are willing to down, so that's another thing. Instead of Docker, what if what if you just had people in the class download the app? And because we trust you that you're not giving us malware, we'll actually run something. Whereas you would not want to do that in a normal user study over the internet. Yeah, I mean, it, like the install process currently isn't too bad. It's just a, you know, pip install, but yeah. <laughs> okay. You must trust. Yeah. Okay, so that's something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Any any other question? So so I think my my main feedback is again trying trying to figure out how to narrow things down so we think that we'll be able to make rapid progress. Um, again, we can work on kind of refining the the core question, but you have you've got a very nice and and clear connection to the human interaction, and I think also having those nice qualitative questions at the end, whether people hate your system or not could be very interesting because it could be that they are able to read faster with higher comprehension, but just hate it, which could be interesting feedback.
All right. It seems like we've uh, paused asking questions on this one or suggesting comments, but thank you for all of those messages in Discord. Would anyone like to go next? Um, I think <clears throat> me and Raven would uh, be down to. Yeah, sure, oh, sorry. Was someone else? Uh, did someone else want to present? Um, that was me, but you can go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I, I barely heard you. You're pretty quiet. Um, okay. Um, I guess let me share my screen quickly just to have our document up. Uh, here. Uh, can you guys see this? Awesome. Yes. Cool. Um, so essentially, what our idea is, okay, so I guess uh, some background. So in like childhood psychology, there's this thing called zone proximal, prox, proximal development, which basically says um, in order to teach someone some a task essentially, or some like progressively harder task, what you need to do is um, teach them in a way that gets progressively harder. Um, so you can't like expect them to straight away do something like at an expert level, but you need to like make the task progressively harder or uh, something along those lines. So there's a paper that kind of does this in the RL context, where instead of um, or instead of actual humans learning things, it's an RL agent trying to learn um, Atari games. And they use uh, basically training examples from a teacher agent that um, they essentially got different levels of uh, teacher agents. So like one that's barely trained and then uh, one that's slightly better and then better and better and better and so forth. Um, and they basically have examples from, um, from each of these different levels of agents. And they basically uh, feed the student RL agent these different levels of um, these different levels of these examples in order for it to progressively learn. And they actually managed to show that, oh, based on this kind of curriculum learning, it actually manages to learn a lot faster. Um, so yeah, so our idea was, so instead of using another, um, another computational agent in order to have these different levels of um, gameplay uh, for some game, why not try it with humans? Why not um, basically get a bunch of examples from different people um, somehow sequence them in terms of uh, in terms of ability or something, or score. I guess you could do as well, um, or also like human self-appointed score. Like, oh, I think I am five on a ten scale in breakout. Let's say. Um, so, uh, why not use human human examples instead? And so, I guess our hypothesis is that yes, using human examples like and feeding it in the ZPD kind of framework uh, should help an agent improve uh, faster. Yes. Um, yeah, so Reven, do you have anything that you want to add? No, that was great. Um, <laughs> I guess just the evaluation we're planning on doing is we want to try to integrate this ZPD framework with a DQN agent or deep Q network, which is what the other ZPD paper that David mentioned did. Um, and they tested on a variety of different Atari games, but we just wanted to limit the scope to the game breakout because we figured it's not too complicated and it has like a fairly linear like skill progression. Um, so we might be able to nicely order all the demonstrations there. And yeah, we, we want to test that against um, some baselines like, you know, what if we didn't order the demonstrations well, we just ordered them randomly. Or what if we only use the best demonstrations and ignore the bad ones? Um, like David was saying earlier, you know, you don't teach straight from an expert. So what if we did teach straight from the expert demonstrations? Would that confuse the agent or not really give us any benefit? Um, yeah, those are the kind of baselines we want to test against. Nice. And um, so you could rely on people to just generate, do the best they can, and then you could figure out how to sort them, or you could have people play at different speeds. So changing, changing the frame weight rate would likely make people better or worse. Um, you could also think about, do I, do I want to sequence people or sequence individual demonstrations? 
So do I want all of Matt's demonstrations to go first because he's awful? Or should I just start with everyone, the, the worst demonstrations from anyone? That could be really interesting. Um, one potential problem is DQN can be slow to train. Um, so if you, you may want to consider using um, a, a different algorithm, a more uh, advanced algorithm like PPO, or thinking about, could I even do this in a non-deep setting? The, the other thing we ran into is uh, a student of mine was looking at good and bad demonstrations in Mario and saying that good and bad was the score. And what we realized is we had some demonstrations that were bad because the human did not beat the level and died, but the human managed to avoid dying for a long time. So it seemed like that there's the number of points you get, but there's also the length of time you survive, whether you complete the level or not. So you, you might consider that there are multiple dimensions to what it means to be good. So if, if in the game of breakout, you think that you can put a full order over demonstrations, that would probably make it be better than, better than Mario. Because with Mario, we were having trouble arguing that, yes, this demonstration is definitely better than this one. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, I, guess, I guess that's one of the reasons why we chose Breakout, because we were considering Super Mario in the beginning. Um, but we did, re like, I think you mentioned, actually, that there were some issues with people, like, who went out of, like, there's a, di how do you compare someone who finishes the game as fast as possible compared to someone else who, you know, collects all the coins, kills all the Goombas, you know? Um, it's not an, it's not exactly a fair weighting. It's kind of a, based on what your definition of performance is. And uh, in terms of the whole DQN being uh, not very sample efficient, we're very aware of that as well. Um, there, we were thinking about maybe using a, like a rainbow, rainbow implementation that there's a paper out that came out recently that's uh, basically rainbow, but sample efficient. So like it does Atari pretty well in like a hundred K frames. So that sounds pretty, good enough, I guess, for maybe what we need, or maybe, I don't know, but there's more of a moving parts as well. So we're gonna have to think a bit about like what algorithm we use or something, yeah. Got it, okay. Oh, that brings up a, a related point. Um, many, many current machine learning algorithms should not be run on your laptop. They should be run on a server like Compute Canada. So if you, if you currently do not have access to compute like that, we should talk because I, I do not want your project um, moving slowly because you, you are trying to train everything on a laptop and, and it's a not, and you, you actually have compute demands. Yeah, I think, yeah, we were, we're definitely gonna have need, compu need compute demands just because of well, the environment and also the algorithms we're running. Um, but I do have access to Compute Canada. I, I'm not sure if Reuben does. Um, and I also have a gaming computer that I use on the side for, you know, gaming and also uh, running our health experiments. So I think we're, I think we should be okay. Yeah, I think I can talk to my academic advisor about using his Compute Canada account. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, I, I really like, I like the idea of, of, of ZPD and I'm excited to say, so the, the, this is this is the ZPD teaching strategies. That's the paper yes. you're. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I, I liked that paper, but saw there were many places it could have been improved. So I'm I'm, I'm really excited that you're thinking about this. And ZPD is going to have to. Uh, we'll we'll be discussing that on Thursday, also I believe, when we talk about intelligent tutoring systems, because it, it applies to agents and people and dogs and everyone else. Cool, cool. Just curious, what um. What didn't you like about this paper? Or if you remember the ZPD one? Um, if I remember right, the I did not find the results convincing. Yeah, I think I remember something about this as well. Oh yeah, yeah. there was a bunch of weird things with their baselines and like- It kind of depended they, on the, uh, yeah. the environment. Yeah. I thought I thought their approach was really cool. I thought the ideas are really cool, but the the results left me wanting a lot more. Mm, okay. Well, hopefully uh, we can uh, do something maybe slightly more clear. Hopefully.
Yeah, and the and the idea of uh, another thing you could think of is um, like we were talking about with uh, Vlad and Rohan's project. If you had different people and different agents of different performance levels generating these demonstrations, is there a wider variety in the kinds of trajectories you get from different kinds of people, and is that better or worse than just mm. having a, a DQN agents trained to different performance levels, because mm. it could be that humans give you a much uh, va more varied play, and that may be useful, or it may harm you. Who knows? Mm. I guess the question comes down to: Are humans better at giving examples than uh, than like a trained agent? And my hypothesis is probably yes. <laughs> so I guess well, we'll see. Yeah. Or, or you could say if if you're trying to train a DQN agent. If you're getting examples from a DQN agent, it's going to be better and more relevant than a human. Yeah, for sure. I guess. Uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> cool. Any other suggestions or questions from people? Okay, I'm going to call that a no. Um, let's see. And then next up. So I'm trying to remember what Bigyan's uh, Big proposal was about. Um, looking at IRL, I think. Yep, that's IRL. Okay. So would you like to uh, explain a little bit what you were thinking about? Sure. So can you see my screen? I'm still seeing a blank uh, uh, black screen. Oh, now I see research proposal. All right. So, um, so we have used uh, reinforcement learning for recommendation, recommendation systems, right? So I just want to investigate if inverse reinforcement learning system can work or produce better recommendation systems. But then I came across a research paper by DeepMind and they highlight uh, two of the shortcomings of IRL. And they also propose that uh, cooperative inverse reinforcement learning can solve uh, these two shortcomings of IRL. So I went on to, so I wonder, so I'm wondering if uh, cooperative inverse reinforcement learning can produce better recommendation systems and in this research project, you know, I would like to delve more into it. So what's uh, uh, cooperative inverse reinforcement learning? So uh, cooperative, cooperative inverse reinforcement learning uh, is a reward modeling or a model of reward function as a two-player game between a user and an, and an agent. And we can think of it as, or how can we train or build a data set. So in each round, a uh, human can select an action, uh, for example, song A, and we can refer it to as a bandit setting, in a, in a bandit setting as an arm, right? So, and, and after that, uh, the robot can intercept, uh, or, or a robot can choose a different action, and the human can observe that action and produce a corresponding reward and the process repeats for some time. And I just want to see that if cooperative in inverse reinforcement learning system can produce a better recommendation system. So that's my project idea. And is, is there a uh, RL based recommender system that you can just plug this into? Well, I think there are a couple of works done just by using pure reinforcement learning but I just want to see if IRL or specifically cooperative inverse RL can perform better than traditional RL algorithms. Yeah, that makes sense. I just want to make sure that you don't have to write a whole recommender system by yourself. So if well, it... Well, yes, there's something called, uh, there's a paper 
uh, called The Assistive Multi-Armed Bandit that was published in 2019. So, so they call this problem of CRL into uh, something called Assistive Bandits. And they have this uh, code in GitHub as well that's open sourced. Awesome. So if you can if you can download that and the code runs and it seems documented, that would be perfect. I know in, in some cases you download someone's code and it takes about two months to get it working. And in, in that case, uh, I think we'd run out of time. So well, I might... hope that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> exactly. So, but we could also think if there is another way to investigate the core differences between IRL and uh, CIRL, and if there was some, you could look at the differences and how uh, the, the rewards extracted from humans and seeing what those differences looked like, then you could argue that they would or would not be more appropriate to this particular setting of um, recommender systems. Yeah, sure. We can, I'm, I mean, I can look at it. Uh, but I, I like the idea. Another, another thing is recommender systems, some of them, I think most of them take kind of the, the multi-arm bandit approach where you're just saying, okay, what, what's the next thing? Some of them take a more RL approach where they're actually worrying, worrying about state. So you can say that playing song A and song B and then song B is very different from playing song B and then song A. So the next best thing can directly depend on the, the, the sequence. It's, um, I don't have a sense of whether the IRL would be better or worse in one of those two, two scenarios. But it, it sounds like you, you've already found um, a good recommender system and it, it sounded like it was using a bandit approach, not, not worrying so much about the sequence. Yep, that's right. So they are, they're calling it the assistive multi-armed bandit problem. Okay, cool. And for, for this to work, do you need a model of the environment or not? Well, I'm not very sure about it, but I think we do need a model. Oh, no, no. I think we don't need a model about, of the environment. Okay. But I'm not very sure about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's something we can look at because a, um, a lot of IRL assumes you have a full model of the environment except for the reward. And, okay. of course, if you're interacting with a human, then you're uh -huh. not going to have a real model. Or but at least that's, yeah, that's maybe true. you won't. Uh, um, other, other ideas about what to, um, ideas or suggestions for this? Oh, I, I forgot to ask. So if you get all this working, you do, you look at IRL or CIRL, what would the, what would the human subject study look like? Would you have people come in and, and try to use this recommender system? So do you mean how to train or create a data set? Right, so where, yeah, how, how, what's the human interaction component? Well, so the uh, human can choose or show the rope, hold on, I just wrote it down. The, so, okay, so human can select X and A, right? And the robot can go on select go on and select X and B, and the human can give a corresponding reward and the process repeats, right? So if you can create a system or web app for a human to choose an accent and for the agent to choose an accent and a way to way for a human to provide a corresponding reward. So that's what I'm thinking of right now, but I'm all open to suggestions. Yeah, because I, I, I think I'm used to, used to thinking of recommender systems as, for instance, showing 10 news articles, and if the user clicks on one of them, then you win. Otherwise, if the user decides nothing, none of the news articles were interesting, they click on something else, and then you lose. So you, you could use that kind of a signal. But you were talking about an agent taking or, or a human taking actions. So maybe you could um, say a bit more about the recommender s s setting you're thinking of. 
well, the uh, the paper called Ossetsi Band-Aids, right? So they use human to select accents as well, and the Azen selects an accent as well. But that accent chosen by Azen is different from that of human. So we need to create a system where humans and Azen can both choose an accent and a way for humans to provide a reward for the accents that uh, the agent takes. Okay. So it sounds like I, I should probably read this paper because I think I'm, I'm missing some of the details of the approach. Well, it's kind of interesting, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, other comments or suggestions on this one? Okay, so I think um, Matt needs to, to read, read the paper, um, so I better understand what you're suggesting, um, but also figure out if, if you can use this software, because if you can't get the, the existing code running, this is gonna be completely infeasible just in terms of time, um, but also thinking about what exactly this human agent interaction would look like. What would be a good setting for them to, to for a human and an agent to take actions and for the human to give rewards? Because we want we want to make sure that that's something that you can easily code up or use this existing paper for. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Anyone else? I know there are some other good ones in there too. I can go next. Awesome. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Great. Um, okay, so the project that uh, I'm proposing uh, I was inspired uh, on it by um, Brian Wilder's paper, uh, Learning to Compliment Humans, that we went over in class. Um, so he, he used uh, human, human expert input um, that was not perfectly um, reliable in order to improve the overall accuracy of a system. And as examples, he used the Galaxy Zoo um, data set and also the Chameleon 16 um, Grand Challenge, which was a, uh, a breast cancer uh, lymph node uh, pathology data set. And so my thinking was to use uh, that data set and, uh, and that approach and modify it and see if adding an additional layer of human supervision, um, both from uh, semi-experts and non-experts, could improve the overall accuracy uh, of the algorithm. So the, the algorithm that Brian Wilder used um, was one of the top performing algorithms in the competition. Um, and so he used the, uh, this, this man's implementation, Arjun Vekaria. Um, and so just going over it very briefly, um, you've got these whole slide images um, that have areas of tumor and, area, and areas that are normal. Um, they're very, very large images, and the goal is to either classify them as tumor or normal. So they're going to, each of them is going to have areas that have tumor and that have normal tissue, or that all have normal tissue um, in the case of normal slides. And so the way he did it, um, he would take the whole slide image, um, which has been annotated by an expert pathologist with uh, unlimited time. He would find uh, the region of interest, so just removing things like white space uh, and obvious artifact from the slides. And then for each of these regions of interest, they were split up into small patches, uh, either contained with normal tissue or uh, tumor. And then these patches, uh, there was some manipulation done on them, and then they were fed into the uh, inception um, uh, convolutional neural network, uh, which was originally uh, created for use on the ImageNet dataset. 
And so what this does is it determines the probability that each of these small patches contains cancer or not. So it creates a, a heat map. Um, and then so Brian Wilder's implementation used this heat map and, and, and then um, had that as the input to his uh, human expert um, system. And my thought was that a human being can look at some of the edges on this heat map, um, especially places where the confidence is, relat is relatively low in what the algorithm thinks is cancer or not. And a human being can look at the actual slide and determine whether there is cancer or not, probably with very high accuracy. Even, even non-experts can probably do this. Um, and that's probably true for a few reasons. Um, the inception is only looking at very small patches at a time, whereas a human could look at, for example, the surrounding eight tiles. Uh, and then also a, a human can generally speaking uh, do that task with pretty high accuracy with very minimal training. So sort of similar to the Galaxy Zoo project. So I was going to have um, both some semi-expert um, MDs and also some uh, just normal people label some of those, uh, some of those edge cases by looking at the actual, um, the actual slide Im image input and determine whether there is any cancer at all or no cancer. And in doing so, it would either turn the probability on the heat map way up to near one if they thought there was cancer or way down to near zero if there wasn't any. And so hopefully this would, this would sharpen the image uh, and would improve the, the final classifier which uses this as input and determines cancer or not. So my hope is, is that um, if, only, if only experts or semi-experts can improve the accuracy of the algorithm, it might not be worth very much. But if, if lay people can, um, can improve it, then, then that would really pave the way to, um, to improving the accuracy of some of these uh, al algorithms. Uh, so I am, I am trying to maximize accuracy, like accuracy essentially at, at all costs. Um, expert versus lay person time. So I'm assuming that um, like ideally I find any any change whatsoever and any improvement in accuracy would be good because this is a state-of-the-art system and if, uh, if I can improve the accuracy in terms of um, reducing the false negatives and false positives um, in any way that would be helpful but if I can especially do it with lay people adding additional um, uh, Re, or, uh, supervision, then that might be applicable in the real world. Awesome. Yeah. Because if you, so now I'm getting it. So if you can just improve it at all, it's a win. And if you can improve it by shifting the burden from experts to lay people, it's even more of a win. Yeah. Like I was thinking if, if lay people can do it, then you, you might even be able to use like mechanical Turk um, yeah. to gather really large data sets of this, which, which might drive up the accuracy even more. That would be cool. And then if, if you had this extra data, it's possible then you could again train the, the whole system to uh, make the end-to-end -end decision itself and then see if that, if that helps or if it just improves the classifier a little bit in some way and then human and loop is still superior. Yeah. So I don't know any pathologists, but I do know um, lots of uh, MDs. And so I'm just going to ask my buddies to help me with that. I wish I had a bunch of MDs. I could just ask for stuff. If you, if you, want, if you have projects that you want to ask them stuff, I, I can get you in touch. Oh, no, I just got this weird lump that I was th no. <laughs> Um. Well, cool. So, okay. And then, so we, we can have two kind of two classes of users, the lay people and the experts. Would you just basically email them images or do you, do you need to have a fancier UI? I don't know. And part of it depends on how, how many images will be needed before there can be any improvement or any change. And so I might need to do a little bit of fiddling and testing myself and, and see, you know, is it on the order of like 20 or 50 images or classification would, would help or is it more like 500? And if it's a high number, I probably will need to have some sort of web application. Okay. 
Yeah, you know, and then, I was also thinking if if the mechanical Turk um, option could work, then in reality, it's possible if you could make it cheap enough, you could almost have human beings doing like the annotation for real world slides, like really, really mechanical Turk style. Um, if you could de-identify the images appropriately, um, if the uh, machine learning doesn't work in the end and kind of replacing uh, pathologists with, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of mechanical Turk workers. The, the other thing I wanted to ask is you, you had proposed one way of getting this kind of extra level of human involvement or supervision. Do, do you think there are other places you could kind of plug a human into this, this system and get other improvements? Probably, but I, I spent a long time trying to think of how, how can human, human input be any better than what you already have, which is really good. Like a, the pathologist providing essentially what is ground truth data with unlimited time and they, they contour where they say the, the tumor is. So there's a little bit of fuzziness in, in, in where they're contouring. Like they're not contouring perfectly and there's a little bit of biological uh, fuzziness as well between what is cancer and what isn't at the boundary. So I thought, well, that's a good place to, to try to target additional supervision. But I would love to know if somebody can think of somewhere else that you know, adding additional time might improve the accuracy because in the grand scheme of things, that's pretty cheap. They did release working code. That was how Brian Wilder, the reason that I know that this is going to be at least semi feasible is that Brian Wilder managed to get all of the code running himself and did some modifications to it. And so hopefully this isn't uh, overly ambitious to get it to work. Awesome. Yeah. And that's a great point, trying to de risk this as much as possible. All right, awesome, thanks, Scott. Um, if anyone else has more ideas, please keep dumping them on Discord. We probably have time for one more. Um, if if no one wants to volunteer, then I was gonna try to volunteer Delaney, but maybe somebody else wants to volunteer? I'm good to go. <laughs> um, I'll just get to my screen. Alrighty, so is this, everyone seeing this, the right screen and the one screen? Awesome. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, uh, as a little context, I uh, work with Carrie, who will be the speaker on Thursday. I've been working with her for about two and a half years um, on how to teach Indigenous languages um, using technology. Indigenous languages in Canada are what's known as low resource languages, so building off of very, very little uh, language data. Um, so another thing that uh, I've been working on in these last couple of years uh, is this game that we've made called Sound Hunters. So um, uh, it's just a little arcade style game here um, that teaches what's called phonological awareness. Um, so, uh, since there's not a lot of like speech data, the next, like being able to like listen and also speak with other people, um, our goal with this is to be able at least be able to read something and know how it sounds. Um, so that's what this teaches. It starts off with, um, teaching letters and then double letter sounds all the way up to words. Uh, the actual mechanics of it is that, uh, you get given a sound on repeat. Um, and you're this little shooter guy down here, and then it's your job to shoot the deer that has the um, correct letter that's associated with the sound being given. So um, this is something I've uh, already worked and done a study on. Um, it currently doesn't have any type of like adaptation in it, but we did prove um, that there is, you do learn with it. We did <laughs> measure learning using this game. Um, so, uh, basically, at a high level, what I'm hoping to do for a study is to implement uh, an adaptive version that's personalized to the player. Um, so, uh, as I said right now, there, there is like different levels and stuff, but for the most part at each level, um, or not for the most part, at each level, um, what you're given is kind of arbitrary. Uh, and so what I'm hoping to do is to have it base, uh, 
what's called user modeling. So try and model what the user knows. Um, and then from there, provide kind of the next question uh, with each question being like the deer coming down. Um, so, and then uh, basically what my study is gonna look like is um, the baseline is gonna be the one that we already have, the one that kind of arbitrarily um, gives questions. Uh, and so how it uh, will hopefully go is that um, some of you fine folk <laughs> will be playing, uh, you'll start with either playing the personalized or non-personalized one, um, and then you'll uh, play the, the opposite one. Uh, and there'll be small transcription tests in between to try and measure learning. And so kind of the highest level uh, hypothesis that I had for this was that we just expect a difference in learning game based on the game sequence mechanism. So uh, in um, like uh, learning technology, uh, learning or learning game, learning is um, kind of defined. You can, if you lose information or gain information, that's what's considered learning. So either way, <laughs> there'll be a difference between um, the order in which you play them. Um, so I have also a bit more information in terms of like um, how I'm gonna be uh, modeling uh, user knowledge and then providing adaptation, but um, it's a bit wordy. Uh, so I'm, if anyone's genuinely interested, I'm happy to have this be shared uh, on eClass or wherever we're sharing the uh, proposals. Cool, yeah, so that was, um, that was a very long one page proposal, but this is a, a very different situation since Delaney's been been working on this hard for over two years. Uh, so this was, I was pretty excited about this case where we had an, an overlap between the course goals and her core research so that she was able to, to use it for both. Um, but the, the other reason I wanted to, her to briefly present her ideas is because I think it do, is going to do a nice job of kind of motivating um, the Thursday's talk, because we're thinking about, well, if, if we can better understand the user and we are treating the user, uh, sorry, modeling the user, then we should be able to help them learn faster. And it would be kind of disappointing if that wasn't true. I guess one, one of the questions here could be, if it doesn't work, is it because we are using the wrong user modeling techniques, we're interpreting those models the wrong way, or is there something special about this problem which makes user modeling not useful? So if, if there's this kind of negative result, it might be, might be hard to parse. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I think in this situation, especially because uh, how far we're, normally when I do this study, it takes 90 minutes, but we're chopping it down for the sake of this course. Um, I think especially because it's going to be my guess in this case would be because um, as far as you would get in the game would be just to the single letters, maybe the double letter sounds. Um, it would be so simple that there would almost be no benefit. That would be my guess if there was, if it turns out there wasn't. Yeah, that's a great point because going, going from 90 to 30 minutes is a pretty drastic cut, but I was, I was worried that people in the class would not be willing to play the game for 90 minutes or, or, or run the study for 90 minutes. So that's, that's something we'll need to think about is how, how to keep track of what people are asking for in time on their study and how much time they're putting into other people's studies. Because if, if you're asking 10 people to do two hours of work for you and you go and work on three people's 15 minute studies, that's eh, not quite comparable. Um, hey, Delaney, can you explain more about the game? Actually, I was kind of interested and maybe yeah, I didn't understand sure. it as well. Um, so it's, um, so basically how it works, like I said, it's, it's a, I'll, I'll bring up the little screen moving GIF again. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, um, it was actually first developed by a high school student, which was pretty cool. Um, uh, when I first joined the lab, we also got high school students that summer. And so um, she, we came up with this idea together. Um, it kind of started based on inspired by space invaders. This is obviously now a, a bit different, um, but how it currently works 
is that uh, you have a little points bar up here and a health bar up here. Um, if you shoot the uh, correct deer, you get points. If you shoot the incorrect one or if the, inc or if the correct one goes past you on the screen so you never manage to hit it, uh, your health bar goes down uh, and then empty health bar means you lose. Um, another aspect of this um, is that, so there's other deer on screen while you're playing. Uh, and I, we call those the distractors because they're supposed to be distracting, right, rather than just having one come down. Uh, and the current uh, aspect of this that makes it harder as you go forward is that, uh, well, there's a couple game mechanics. So um, this would be the harder level. At the easier level, there's only, you have the correct one and then two other um, distractors on screen, whereas the harder one, you have one more and they come down faster. But um, in terms of, uh, distracting on a language sense. Uh, in this case, uh, we basic, we have, um, as it gets harder, the, the letters that are uh, with, on the distracting deer are more similar, either in sound or visually, um, to the correct one. So for example, in this example, uh, the K sound is being given, uh, and there's a G here. Um, in Cree, the K can often sound like a G, um, but there is no G in the Cree alphabet. So that's why that one would be audibly similar. Um, and uh, uh, from basically there's four, just to the, my whole spiel, <laughs> uh, is that there's four subtasks for this. There's the single letters as you see here. So double letter sounds, all valid double letter pairs you would ever see in the language. Uh, and then from there we did what's called minimal pairs. Minimal pairs are two words that are exactly the same but differ by one sound, um, which occur a lot in Cree. An example in English would be sun, fun, run. Uh, and then it just has kind of words in general. Um, but uh, yeah, and then we also wrote a paper on it and published it this last summer. So. Um, that's also available if anyone's genuinely interested. So is there like an, like an audible sound coming out of a game while you're playing and then you're trying to hit that letter? Yeah, exactly. So okay. this is just a GIF, so it's not, yes. it doesn't okay. have that. But with this, there'd be like a G sound being played like once a, I can't remember how often, on repeat. <laughs> so if, you, you were mentioning this might be too easy. So if, would it be possible to just teach, instead of teaching all the letters, could you teach just a subset of the letters so that you could more quickly move to the more difficult stages? Or does that not make any sense? Probably. Um, I think especially in this context, you probably could because, um, so the Cree, there's a couple of different writing systems for Cree, but uh, there's one that uses the same, This it's called standard Roman orthography. It's the same, alphabet is English essentially. It has um, fewer letters though. Uh, some of the letters, like if, if you knew for sure, especially if they were first language English speakers and the, the letters had the exact sound as they did English and in Cree, you could probably not focus on those as much um, and instead focus on the ones that do differ. I mean, like that would probably get you through faster with the most amount, like still having the same amount of knowledge. Like M still makes a M sound. Um, so I think in that, there's probably something around just taking advantage that everyone who's doing it probably knows English decently well. Okay, cool. Any other comments or suggestions or questions? Okay, well, I think we should probably wrap up here for time reasons anyway. So for Thursday, remember to uh, watch those videos. For those of you who did not get a chance to present, if you could please send me an email or Discord and let me know if you would like to present or not in the next, uh, probably not the next class, probably next Tuesday. If you think this would be useful uh, to you, please let me know. I'm going to ask people whether we can uh, share these proposals, maybe either, either this initial draft or the, the final draft uh, pilot uh, proposals. And also we should figure out the best way to go from what you submitted on Saturday to what you're going to submit as the final proposal. So I, we need to figure out whether we should do individual meetings where we uh, video chat with the different groups, 
whether we should, uh, whether you just want written feedback because the, the discussion during class was enough. But if you could kind of think about how I can best help you take your initial thing that you submitted and then try to improve that for the final thing that you submit that you're actually com committing to. Um, so if you, what's the best way? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that we're going to end up wanting to schedule individual meetings. But if you have other, other ideas, please do let me know that as well.